Welcome to Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth, a series of conversations about the life and teachings of Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is considered to be one of the most important Catholic intellectuals and writers of the 20th century. Incredibly prolific and diverse, he wrote over 100 books. He is also co-founder with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger of the acclaimed theological journal, Communio. It is the purpose of this series of programs to introduce some of the themes of Balthasar's work, and perhaps to help some understand better why Hans Urs von Balthasar is so important for modern theology and for the lived experience of the Church today. Balthasar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. In this episode, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Anthony Lillis, Academic Dean of St. Patrick's Seminary, located in Menlo Park, California. Dr. Lillis is the author of numerous books on the spiritual life and is widely considered a scholar of the Carmelite mystical tradition. With Dr. Anthony Lillis, we continue our conversation on Hans Urs von Balthasar's book, Christian Meditation. Welcome, Anthony. Hello, Chris. It's so good to be with you. I'm excited about the series we're doing. I am too. I I was not as familiar with Hans Urs von Balthasar's Christian Meditation. It became more known to me through our series of conversations. I guess I read it years ago, but I didn't take it in as deeply as I am now. It is so incredible, isn't it? It is. I think... Those who know the Ignatian exercises will recognize a wonderful crystallization of St. Ignatius's teaching, but um, at the same time, there's something uh, also opened up that's genuinely the fruit of his relationship with Adrian von Speyer and, their, and the new community they started in Switzerland. Uh, you can tell that this is the product of prayer. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because this really does seem to be a teaching that was meant to be given to not only individuals, but to groups. You know, it is, it's basic 101, isn't it? Yeah, well, I guess you could say that, although I would say his basic 101, I know very, very many uh, priests who uh, would have benefited from having this very basic teaching and never had it. Hmm. Um, and so, so there would, there'll be a lot of people who read this and some of them will say they just won't believe it because it's so different than anything they heard. Uh, and then many, many more people who have struggled to pray will read it and go, why didn't I have this years ago? And in particular, I've noticed through the years and working with seminarians that they, they come to seminary and they begin the practice of a, a daily holy hour but no one's really taught them how to go into the silence. They just kind of go in and they're exhausted at the end of the day or barely awake at the beginning of one. And their mind kind of drifts all over to different distractions and, or they're resting. They're just so uh, uh, tired and exhausted. They're just kind of resting in the presence. And there's, there's a good thing that happens there. I'm not going to say that that's, there's anything wrong with that, but, that's resting in the presence of, of the Lord in a very kind of physical way. There's another kind of rest that our spirit needs, and it's the rest that we can find in the presence of the Lord. And this book teaches you how to enter the presence of the Lord. So just because you go into Eucharistic Adoration Chapel and there's the real presence, the, the Lord is fully present to you. He's present in his real presence, which is dynamic and powerful, but the question is, are you present to the Lord? And you can go into Eucharistic Adoration Chapel, be completely distracted, and not be present to the Lord. It's like coming into the room with a loved one, and the loved one's fully present to you, fully attentive to you, but you're not really attentive to this loved one who needs your attention. So how do you learn to give God the attention that he deserves? How do you learn to be present to him in a way that he's in the same way that he's present to you. And one level, we can't be his present 
to him as he is present to us because he has our creator. He's more present to us than we are to ourselves. But in another way, we, by faith and by the life of grace in us, we can be present to him in an analogous way. And it's there that the wisdom of Hans Urs von Balthasar especially cracks open some very with some very important counsels that I think we need to take into prayer. The second section that we're entering now in this particular book in Christian meditation, I think this was one of those aha moments for me when I read particularly the second sentence. He, he talks about literature is sparing in giving directions on how to meditate. Generally, such directions omit the decisive middle part. And when I read that, I thought, there's a middle part? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and then as I'm, I'm reading it, oh my gosh, I guess I never understood that so clearly. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I think now today, I think there's a lot of uh, literature on meditation out there, actually, compared to maybe when Hans Urson Balthasar wrote this work. Uh, if you go to Barnes and Nobles, you, you'll find uh, shelves and shelves and shelves of books on meditation. And, but it's not Christian meditation, typically. And even among those who are pr- promoting Christian meditation, uh, 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 there's, um, there's kind of a, um, a very, very little written on this dis- decisive moment of prayer that von Balthasar wants to turn our attention to. And so that this is what typically happens. Uh, you have the intellectual approach to, to meditation. And because this is a little bit more prevalent among devout Catholic souls who've been trying to live the good Christian life, uh, he's going to address this more at the beginning of this. But I, I think we also need to say a little bit about some of the kind of more new age stuff. And so let me start with the the first. Is is that okay, Chris? Oh, please do, Anthony. I would love to have this cleared up, not only for myself, but I'm sure a lot of people out there would like to understand it. Yeah, so there's an approach to meditation where you you choose what I'm going to meditate on, whether it's the scriptures or or some other spiritual book. And so this is going to be the material of my meditation. And I enter into meditation, I read it, and I use the power of my reason to try to understand what the author of the sacred scriptures or the church father or the saint or the mystic is going to say. And so I, and what I'm, I'm doing, my engagement in meditation is to try to figure out what the text is actually saying. Now, is that a bad thing? It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's not at the level of prayer. You've done some preparation to enter into prayer, but you haven't begun to pray. And so, so somebody will, will talk about this engagement and, and what von Balthasar is saying is they'll talk about this and then they don't lead you into a deeper encounter with the word. And, and part of the problem is everything that I just described where you, you choose the text, you read the text, you try to understand the text, that's preparatory for meditation, but that's not meditation itself. And that's the beginning of mental prayer, but it isn't, and by meditation, the way he's using it and the way I'm using it right now, I mean the beginning of mental prayer or contemplative prayer. The catechism calls that where you're just thinking about the text, using your natural light of reason to think about the text in front of you. The catechism of the Catholic Church calls that meditation. It says that that's not yet prayer. Christian meditation, according to von Balthasar, needs another movement. And he's going to spend a lot of time in the ne- that next movement. We will too. But before we can go there, we need to jump. The, the, other, the other side of it is where literature goes. And sometimes it's the same book. Sometimes it's a different book. Uh, but that first movement of towards meditation where you're thinking about a book and you're doing the mental, mental gymnastics with, with the book and you're kind of um, trying to figure things out with a light of reason, that's a there, there's something good in it. It's not bad, but it's not enough. In a way, if meditation stops there, all you have is an intellectual head trip, but you don't yet have an encounter with the Lord. On the other hand, there are those who kind of leapfrog this middle section that 
that von Balthasar wants to bring our attention to. And, and they instantly want to talk about either acquired or infused contemplation. So what's the difference? Acquired contemplation is contemplative acts that you can achieve by your own industry. And so there are natural forms of enlightenment or psychic states that you can induce by your own energy and efforts. And sometimes, or oftentimes, I would say some of there's literature, I would say centering prayer, a lot of literature and centering prayer is about this. Some of the literature in Catholic mindfulness is about this, where you use a meditation technique, but you're in mastering the technique, your effort is to induce a psychic state or a, some kind of enlightenment. And by psychic state, it, I mean, you know, you're anxious and so you're trying to make yourself calm or uh, enlightenment, you have confusion in your mind, and all of a sudden you have an insight that kind of brings clarity, you know. Well, there's nothing wrong with a psychic state, and there's nothing wrong with enlightenment where you have a new form of clarity where you're seeing the world differently, and it gives you a kind of freedom. Enlightenment and psychic states, just like the intellectual gymnastics of reading a text and understanding it and mulling it over, all of those things are good things. I, I wouldn't uh, deny anybody any of those things, but none of that in and of itself is really Christian meditation. That's why with the centering prayer people, if you go into their, as you advance higher and higher into their workshops, at the highest level of their, their highest le workshops, they start talking about going beyond Catholic doctrine, going beyond the tribalism of the Catholic Church and to a more universal a more universal encounter with God that, um, uh, that resonates with more religions and more spiritual people. So you write in that kind of enlightenment, uh, that kind of uh, spiritual evolution, whatever else it might be, it's no longer Christian. Once you go beyond Jesus, your prayers and Christian prayer. Von Balthasar believes the highest, most sublime, most powerful prayer on the face of this earth is Christian prayer. And this other kind of enlightenment thing that some spiritual writers are writing about right now, that's not what von Balthasar is talking about. Neither is it better, more salvific. Neither it's not more meaningful von Balthasar is going to make, he's very polemical and he doesn't do as much polemics in this particular work but if we look at his whole corpus he's down on centering prayer and because of that he I think some of the tendencies in what we're calling Catholic mindfulness right now he would offer kind of a corrective to some of the tendencies where they're looking for a therapeutic effect in prayer He's not really for therapeutic, seeking therapeutic effects. So all of that is kind of acquired contemplation. Notice that all of it that I just described to you, it can involve prayer, but it doesn't necessarily have to involve prayer. What do I mean by that? Well, when in Christian prayer, technique is always subordinated to the act of faith. In some of the scenarios I just went through with you, the act of faith at, is at least at risk for being subordinated to the technique. Insofar as that's a tendency in some spiritual literature when they talk about meditation, where they're advancing a technique and something, a, a state of consciousness that you can acquire through this technique, they're not advancing an act of faith, they're advancing maybe a very therapeutic, psychologically enlightened, or at least good mental hygiene. They might be advancing all of that, but they're not advancing an encounter with the Lord himself, who is the healer, but he's more than healer. He's also sovereign Lord. And the, the final thing that you'll often find literature on, although not often very good literature is those who talk about mystical contemplation. And von Balthasar is going to talk about that in his work here, but uh, he kind of presumes mystical graces and prayer almost through his whole treatise. If if you wanted to, it's I'm using a more Carmelite Thomistic language to talk about, to try to describe what he's doing in this book. 
But what often happens, though, in the discussions on mystical com- contemplation is the graces that are discussed about appear to be to readers so r- rare and lofty and beyond the scope of normal Christian experience that it either discourages people or it mystifies them or they just can't relate. Von Balthasar, what he wants to do in this book, Christian Meditation, is not put the emphasis on the heights of mystical contemplation or what you can achieve by acquired acquired forms of contemplation or recollection. Uh, Neither is he going to put the emphasis on, on the efforts to select what you're going to meditate on and techniques for understanding with your reason what the book is actually saying. You might think about Mortimer Adler's book, How to Read a Book. He's not going to tell you how to read a book. He's going to be relentless on all the way through this text, especially in the second part, is how do you avail your soul so that you can be more attentive to the Lord who is wholly attentive to you? And he's relentless on this point. And that's why this section is so important. That attentiveness is key, isn't it? Yeah, I think that as we get into the the beauty of Christian prayer, uh, key to understanding von Balthasar's teaching on Christian meditation is that you're dealing with something relational, interpersonal, an encounter between myself and the word of the Father. And in this encounter, what's most important is to understand what's going on in the mind and heart of Jesus. Just like when I'm talking to somebody, I struggle to understand their words so that I can understand better what's going on in their mind and heart. And Jesus is coming to you in prayer, he is not there to manipulate you or uh, put you down, and, and he's not playing a game with you. He's come to you because he wants you to understand him, and he wants you to understand him because when you understand him, you understand the Father. Jesus is the Word of the Father, and as the Word of the Father, He aches, he yearns, he desires that we might know the Father as he knows the Father. And so this is the starting place and the place of emphasis for von Balthasar in his text. He wants us to be aware of the personal presence of Jesus. There was a bishop, I've told this story before, but Bishop Anthony Bloom in his conversion experience, he wanted to disprove Christianity He had made kind of a resolution that he was going to read the Gospel of Mark, write a manifesto disproving Christianity and the claims that are in the Gospel of Mark because they must be totally ludicrous, he he believed. And after writing the manifesto, he was going to take his life. And he was a, a young man, probably in his early 20s or so in Paris. His family had been totally disrupted after the Bolshevik Revolution. And there was all this uncertainty and angst, and and he was angry with God. So angry, he refused to believe in God anymore. So he pulls out the Gospel of Mark. He begins reading the Gospel of Mark. And while he's reading the Gospel of Mark, he notices in the room there is a personal presence there. The personal presence is not condemning. The personal presence is not chiding or putting him down in any way. It's just gently there with him. He made an association between that personal presence with the Jesus, the Jesus whom he was reading about in the gospel. And so he began to address this personal presence. And as he addressed this presence, the presence began to respond to him little by little. And he said, he said, and that's when I began to pray. I started in a conversation 
with his presence, who is Jesus. And the conversation has never stopped. And so what happened, he went from being an atheist to being a medical doctor during World War II. While he was a medical doctor working for the resistance in France, he also studied to be a priest in the Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox Church, and eventually became the Russian Orthodox Patriarch of Paris, and then eventually and uh, went to Oxford and taught in Oxford at the very end of his career. And he wrote many, many books on prayer, and those books uh, throughout my life have been very helpful for me because they're the product of a genuine conversation with the Lord. If he's Orthodox, he's not Catholic. I, when I first started reading him, I didn't even know what Orthodox he was. I, only knew, mm -hmm. I just assumed all bishops were Catholic. And I was so impressed with his ability to quote the scriptures, but also talk about Jesus in a personal way, in a warm way. And so he opened up for me the treasury of Catholic prayer. Well, just like Anthony Bloom was doing that in the Russian Orthodox Church, there were a group of people like Hans Urs von Balthasar who were trying to do this in the Catholic Church to help us rediscover this conversation with the Lord. In fact, the ancient Benedictines, there are three great vows that they they take one of them is the vow of conversatio morum the conversatio morum sounds is what it sounds like conversatio sounds like conversation and some people have translated it to mean conversion and it does mean that but the kind of conversion that happens in a conversation or a dialogue in an exchange an exchange of hearts. As you exchange your heart with the Lord, something happens to your whole manner of life. And more room means whole manner of life. Your praise, your orthodoxy, should impact the way you live, your orthopraxis, what you do. And as you enter into conversation with the Lord, your whole being is put in dialogue with him Things in your life are going to change. And this is what von Balthasar wants to have happen for you. And so that's why he's going to emphasize this relational, this personal, this conversational aspect of, um, of meditation or mental prayer. It is so compelling, isn't it, that the emphasis, as you just beautifully broke open for us, is for him on the word the capital W, the word, the person of Jesus. And in that very first point that he makes in this section is that you have to be aware of his genuine presence as the word. That it just it, he, he would say, in every case, he is word. And now he is the word just for me. And that's in reference to pondering the scriptures. I mean, taking in the scripture now and receiving it, it's the word communing, communicating with me. And that's, that's an important paradigm or a vantage point in all this, isn't it? Yes. So Jesus, the word of the Father, wants to communicate to you personally. And how does he communicate to you? How does he speak a fullness of meaning into your heart? That's the great problem that God needed to find a solution for. And so he revealed himself to people over the course of centuries leading up to Jesus. They committed that revelation to writing, and so we have the Old Testament. But everything in the Old Testament leads, culminates in the Word because it was the Word of the Father, who gave them their words. And so the the scriptures, the Old Testament, and the New Testament after that, all, everybody after Jesus is a witness to Jesus as the fulfillment of everything that's in the Old Testament. And so we speak of the scripture as the words of the word. Uh, and this is the fathers of the church love this, the words of the word. And when you read the scripture, to go back to our, the 
first part of our conversation, it's not enough to figure out what the text is saying. And so now I've mastered the text and so I've had a good prayer time. What is at stake is Jesus, the word of the Father, is revealing the Father to you. And the way he's revealing the Father to you is through the particular concrete exigencies that are communicated in the scriptures here. If I only understand what the words are saying, and I don't go from the words to what's in the heart of Jesus, I've missed the whole the whole point of the scriptures and why they exist. The scriptures are not a history book. They're not a informational book. They are the way, the means by which the word communicates to me to reveal the Father. And how does he communicate to me? He communicates to me through the concrete things that he says and does in the scriptures. When he admonishes the Pharisees, he's admonishing me. When he forgives the, the sinner, he's forgiving me. When he is breaking bread with his disciples, he's breaking bread with me. When he is crucified, I'm the one who's crucifying him. I'm also the one who he invites me to stand under the shadow of his cross with his mother. All of this is true in these texts. All of these biblical texts speak directly to me as a person. And through each one of the miracles that Jesus does, each one of the teachings that he does, the admonishments he gives, but also the things that he suffers for my sake, in each case, he's revealing to me personally the love of the Father. If I'm approaching the scriptures then as the way that Jesus speaks to me about the Father's love, as I read the scriptures, instead of resting simply at the meaning of the text, I need to go from the meaning of the text to ask the question, what does this tell me about the heart of Jesus? The more I understand his heart, the more I know the Father. Von Balthasar says we are uh, using language of St. Paul from the book of Ephesians. Our effort is to understand the love that surpasses all understanding. What does it mean to understand? To stand on. Uh, uh, when we know the truth about something, uh, we're, that truth on one hand, it purifies our judgment. The better our judgment, the more we can respond to what needs to be responded to, the more intensely we can live. We can live a fullness of life to the extent that we understand the truth. The truth is the ground of our existence. Without the truth, we lack that which can bear the weight of our existence. The human person is such that he the specific weight of our being, the love in our heart, needs to be rooted in truth. Without that truth, without understanding, we're at risk. Our integrity is at risk. And Jesus knows that. And so that's why he reveals himself through the words and the events of the sacred scripture. This concludes part two of our conversation with Dr. Anthony Lillis discussing Hans Urs von Balthasar's Christian Meditation. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with many other episodes of this particular series, visit vonbalthasar.com. There, too, you can also access audio excerpts from this book, and from others in the Balthasar Library. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will consider subscribing to this particular podcast and liking it on whatever platform you may be hearing it on. And most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about bonbalthasar.com and join us for the next episode of Balthasar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth.